to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Styles and Rosenberg. Ebro in the Morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg. Uh, this is a serious conversation we're having today and a necessary conversation. Uh, give it up for Drew Dixon one time uh, on HBO Max right now. Uh, what's the name of the documentary again, Laura Styles? It's called On the Record. On the Record. Now, uh, Drew Dixon, before we get going, is this the same documentary that was supposed to be supported by Oprah Winfrey? Yes, it's the same one. And and can you clear up why Oprah Winfrey pulled out of supporting this documentary? Wow, you would have to ask Miss Winfrey that. I never really understood what happened. All I know is that in about a year ago, actually, so this time last year, I was told she'd seen a rough cut and she loved it and she wanted to join the project as an executive producer. And I cried like real tears of joy, like, wait, Oprah Winfrey knows who I am, what? <laughs> and she wants to support this film. And, you know, she's a survivor. She's just such, you know, a hero of mine, really. She had been for so many years and she still is. And I thought she was the perfect person to stand beside us as black women coming forward with something so difficult and painful. And she took it to Apple and they picked it up. And as far as I knew, it was all good. I was told she'd seen several different cuts of the film and had given notes and was really involved in the process. I think it was actually Harpo that submitted the film to Sundance and she did a press release the day before Sundance announced their selections because she was so proud of it. So I thought we were really, I mean, like in the best possible hands. I couldn't have imagined a better person to make sure this film came out and was, you know, received in the black community in a way that, you know, would hopefully begin a conversation that I think is really important for us to have. And then, all I knew was that just really like I it wasn't even I don't think two weeks before Sundance she exited the project um, and it was just like the floor fell out from under us you know I was like in a fetal position in my apartment for three days I didn't know what to think and then I do believe that things happen for a reason. I believe in God. And I think that going to Sundance with Sherry Cher and Salai and standing there shoulder to shoulder with my sisters without this sort of fairy godmother that I think I was hoping on some level to hide behind made us all realize that we were stronger than we thought mm -hmm. and that we could just stand in our truth and that we could just face whatever came next. And so that's really essentially all I know as far as how it all went down, I never truly understood her decision-making process, but obviously she's entitled as a businesswoman to do whatever she thinks is the right thing. Right. Uh, my girlfriend, Shanita Hubbard, who's an incredible voice, she's the one who actually put me onto the film and she's the one who told us that our show was actually a part of the film. And um, I, I do want to talk about your reaction and how you felt about the conversation that that you were about to watch because I, I thought it was a very powerful moment because you were there with your goddaughter who was a teenager and you thought that yeah, it, you already yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well she seemed really young but you thought that you already had a, a, a preconceived notion of what you were gonna hear how did you feel uh, I mean obviously for the people who, who have not seen the video yet how did you feel about our conversation I was so relieved once I listened i think i got a text or something that you guys were talking about it and my heart like dropped and my stomach flipped you know the community that i care about the most most in terms of its response to this film is really the black community and especially the hip-hop community i love hip-hop so much and i it's it's so important to me frankly that people see this film that we have this conversation because i think this is going to make us stronger and that's the whole point and like god knows we can't afford to go out into this world that's already so hard on us in every single way if we are not strong within ourselves and but my fear also was being misunderstood by my own community and especially the hip-hop community and hot 97 is where hip-hop lives 
I understand what Russell Simmons represents, not just to the hip hop community, but to Hot 97. And so it just felt like the moment of truth in some ways for me. And I didn't know if there would be any kind of an open mind at all to what we were saying and to what had happened to us. So it was really terrifying. It really was the moment of truth for me. And I was so grateful that you guys were open, like you came to it with an open heart and an open mind and that you were having a conversation, a painful conversation. This is family business, you know? And so I was touched really that, you know, it was like a little bit of an exhale moment, you know, that my own community was having the conversation and wrestling with the parts about this conversation that are hard because we understand more than anybody else could what Russell represents and all of the good that he has done. And so it's a loss. It's just a tremendous loss to confront the reality of this other side of what he has done. And so that was really all I could have hoped for. And so I was really grateful that you came with an open heart to the discussion. And I hope that's what happens when people see the film, that they'll even see it at all, really that they won't be closed to it. So thank you for that. Um, you, um, no, you're welcome and it's our pleasure. And I, you know, I think, um, as you said, it is one of those things where it's kind of like over the past several years, um, you know, for me, I had, you know, had no problems discussing the sickness of an R. Kelly, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, um, even for me, the sickness of a, of a, you know, um, what we saw with Michael Jackson and to what degree, what's true and what's false. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that process, you're confronted with the reality that we don't know any of these individuals outside of work. Mm -hmm. I know you at work. Like Russell, I talked to Russell three weeks ago and he still maintains that he never raped anyone. And I told him, and I told him, that's not the other story, and there's too many stories that say different. And I've even asked him, my man, how much drugs were you doing? Because I know the Russell from the 80s, and it was just doing dope and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and wilding and doing whatever. How much were you high, and how much are you hiding what your true behavior is because you're also ashamed. Yeah, do you think Drew do you think there's a chance that he's hiding it almost from himself? And then like he's he, hiding it from himself. Yeah, like he doesn't believe it. he truly himself believes it didn't happen. I believe that he is I don't know the right term if it's a sociopath. I think I don't know which of the words it is. I think he deludes himself. I also think he was sober. I'm gonna just go ahead and say. Mm. I, I this happened in October. Um, I remember generally kind of the date because I remember that the show soundtrack was at the top of the charts, was the number one R&B album for seven weeks. And so it, it was in that window of Amazing time. soundtrack, by the way. Great job. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I love My Block by Tupac. My Block right. by Tupac is one of my favorite records that he ever made. Uh, I talked to him on the phone to get that record. It was overcut, Easy Mo be overcut. And I was like, wait, what? Y'all got extra joints? Send me a joint. I oh, that's it. amazing. But, and then we had to go mix it again at Quad. It was anyway, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> um, I don't even think he was, I think he was sober. Mm. I mean, he had some weird thing where from his birthday to New Year's, he would like give up drinking and, and drugs. It was some like tradition of his. And yep. I feel like- I've birthday, heard him talk about like, it before. In October, Russell was as sober as a heart attack, okay? This was premeditated. He wasn't out of his mind. He just told me to come upstairs to get a demo. And honestly, I wasn't even sure when I got in the elevator with him if we were going to go to his office. He had an office in a completely different apartment in his in that same building. Or if we were going to go down the hallway, get off on a different floor to go to his apartment to get the demo. I mean, it was just such a, a trap. I mean, it was just like little incremental, well, I'll order you a car. Okay, now you've kind of got five more minutes. Okay, come, I, I have a demo. Okay, you know, 
let's go upstairs and grab the, you know what I mean? Like it was just step by step, you know? And even when we entered his apartment, I'm like, oh, wow, we're going into his apartment. But then again, I I thought he was calling Simone, his assistant, who was often in his apartment to get the car. So I kind of thought, okay, she's upstairs. And then we're like, oh, like we're in your apartment. But then he he went a different direction. So that kind of made me feel more relaxed. Like he was like, hang on, I got to just, you know what, go down that hall. And then he like went a whole different way. So he's like kind of giving me directions from like over where I can't see him. He's just, I hear his voice go straight. And I'm like, where keep going. Okay. There's a CD player. I don't, okay. Make a right. And I'm like, now I'm like way kind of off past, you know, where I started, but he's also not with me. So I'm also feeling, you know, I'm okay. I'll just get the CD and leave and leave. And I remember the CD was nothing in the tray. It was like a very fancy machine. Like he's rich, right? So it wasn't like press, you know, it was like sleek. I had to find the power button and there was nothing in the tray. And I'm like yelling, it's empty. Oh, it's, it's on the shelf. So I'm now like, you know, really like focused, like, you know, but I, and I'm not thinking I'm in danger. I'm just thinking, you know, there's a car, probably it's here by now. And then, you know, he's the next thing you know, he's like, here you know and he's naked and he's physically grabbing me and you know i mean it was a fight it was a fight it was a straight up and down fight okay like a physical brawl where he was ripping off my clothes and i am fighting him and he's grabbing my wrists and i'm kicking i mean straight up i'd actually just had a medical procedure with my OBGYN. I'm going to just be real honest. I had like a pad with like discharge where I wasn't even supposed to wear like a tampon or anything, nothing. I was like begging him. I'm like, you can mm. harm me. You could literally harm me. Look, you can see it, right? Please. And then it was just stop fighting, like cold, like stop fighting. I mean, it was, it was rape, y'all. It was straight up and down violent rape. Mm. Okay. And I've talked to the other survivors. There are things that aren't even in our stories that are published that we've shared, like the pin move with the wrist. We've all experienced it. He is a premeditated serial rapist. And it's just, I don't even know how you, I don't even know how that works in your brain. I don't even know how, I don't know. I guess you can pass the polygraph test if you can switch up like that. It's like heavy to think about what that feels like, how you carry it, what you tell yourself, what you tell your daughters. That's like a prison of itself that he lives in. Right. That I can't imagine what that's like. But it's, I, I, I don't even, I, is he confused? I don't know. Are, are serial killers confused? I don't know. Right. I don't know how you well, do there's, that. Yeah, there's, they're, like as Laura pointed out there, or, or you, um, there's a complete disconnect they're hiding from themselves. It's it's yeah. it's, it's some psych it's some psychological shit that I'm trying because I don't get it right. I, I, it's some psychological shit that we're all you know learning because now stories like yours are teaching us, and we yes. thank you for that. And we thank you for being brave enough to teach us to to not only listen, uh, but to understand and accept there are. Uh, attributes about individuals we think we know that we don't know. We don't know. And and you even know. like I said, and even in talking to him, he maintains um, that story. And and what he is not dealing with is the reality um, that you all in this documentary, all of your stories line up. They're yeah. all the same story. It, that's that's one of the craziest parts about the movie is. When you start meeting the other women and everyone's stories. So if you're watching the movie and you decide, I don't believe this Drew Dixon character. Let, let, let's say you're, you're coming at it from that perspective. Okay. But then you, you meet several other women from totally different walks of life who all tell the same story and don't know each other. And I also think, Drew, like when I watched the film, I, I, it was the first time learning about you, all the amazing things you did, how you were responsible for Method and Mary, all, you know, I'll be there for you, and the, from the show soundtrack. You said one thing that really, really got to me, because after you left Def Jam, then you had to deal with L.A. Reid, and then how you just kind of quit because you couldn't handle it anymore. Imagine all the amazing art that you could have 
that you could have made afterwards, like the contributions that you could have made to this culture that you were, all of that was ripped from you. And, and, and that to me was very powerful. And, and it was also very powerful because not only were you telling your story, but at the same time, when you talked about the struggles of, of outing this incredible man who has delivered so much to, to hip hop and how you said like, yo, we all loved him, I loved him. I was so proud of him. You know, my, I mean, when I, I mean, you know, I started in hip hop in 92. You know, my parents were like, wait, what are you doing? Like, what even is hip hop? Like, I remember my right. first internship was at Jive Records and I wasn't getting paid. And my mom was like, that is Jive. You know what I mean? Like, you know, they didn't, I, what are you doing? And I was like, no, this is so important. You know, hip hop is gonna, it's, 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 it's amplifying our voiceless in this beautiful way. It is the swagger of black people. Like it is just dope. This is before hip hop had a Grammy category. Like it was, you guys know. And and so I I I did love it. I still do love it. And and I was gonna give up after what happened, you know, at Def Jam, but I had this number one album. So I started getting calls from all the majors. And I was really like, not even gonna take one of those jobs, but then I met Clive and I loved him and he was like a music man. And he was, you know, like, you know, Clive would always joke, like when I would argue with him, like I signed Q-tip to a so solo deal when, you know, Tribe broke up. And I remember we were like arguing about something about Q-tip's record and I thought he wasn't focused on it. And he was like, all you have to do to get Drew like to not be mad, like in a meeting is play like a record that you have the only copy of, like some TLC record or some Sarah McLaughlin record or something that she loves. And it's you like it's done. Like one minute in, she's like, "All right, cool, we get, we get." You know what I mean? And you know, I, 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 I went there, and you know, I mean, I Montel Jordan, I knew from Def Jam. He came and brought me. Nobody's supposed to be here, and I gave that to Deborah Cox. You know what I'm saying? Amazing um, record. That record I, is amazing. Brand new being together. Brand new being with <laughs> a reunion album, and and I knew Alamo from before, and so I signed Brand New to Arista, and we made they made Foundation, and I helped make that happen and i was so proud to be making such a black record they and don't let it go to your, and don't let it go to your head don't was their last big head. moment they got to have as a group you know yes i signed loon okay who's on don't let it go to your head you know what i mean and then when clive left i was gonna go with clive but then i thought you know what i've had these hits you know i'm on fire right and i'm i was 29 i think by then and i was like you know what I'm gonna start my own label. I have 18 months left in my contract. I could stay with LA, who I'd known for years. I actually met LA Reed when I was, right before Death Jam, I was at Zombie Music Publishing, where I signed Nas's publishing before Illmatic, and I signed Eric Sermon's publishing. And I tried to sign Outcast Publishing, which is how I met LA Reed. And he'd known me and was always respectful of me. And I was like, you know what? I could just work for LA for 18 months and then start my own label. I set it up, it was called Possum. I signed Alice Smith, the singer. And I was like starting to get my confidence back because I'd had this run with Clive and I didn't want to do a five year deal at J Records and wait five more years to start my own thing. And then as soon as I like basically broke up with Clive and he was mad at me that I didn't go to J Records, everything changed. You know what I mean? Like it was like my bridge was burned. L.A. Reid is now my boss. And all of a sudden it was like, wear skirts and heels every day, Drew, to work. I started wearing jeans and Birkenstock clogs because I knew he hated those. Okay. Um, you know, there's even like, it's not even in the movie. I signed this artist, Toya, from St. Louis. She had this record called I Do. It was the number one Cherbin record in the country. Cherbin, okay? I heard that, that language a right? long time. Crossover <laughs> we made urban. This album that was dope. L.A. loved it. And he kept saying, come to my hotel after you finish in the studio and listen to the album. And I was already knowing what that was. So I would just always like pretend I didn't get his message or be like, yeah, uh, let me hit you back. And they're just like, wouldn't. And there was like a meeting one day at Arista where all the promotion people were psyched to talk about Toya because I do was testing so well nationally and how we were going to break her. And then Ellie Reed literally looks down the table at me. He's like, everybody take out your pens, draw lines through Toya. I listened to her album last night in my hotel room. And he like looked at me and I hated it. We're not going to chase that record anymore. And the promotion people were like, wait, but what, huh? Wait, it's blowing up. Like, we're not chasing it. And that was it. Like, I had a point. He killed her career. She's a stay-at-home mom now. Okay. He, he killed the record I'd worked on for a year and a half. We had a couple Dallas Austin joints. We had a TI record. 
Okay? Killed it. That's not even that's not even in the movie because nobody heard of Toya, really. Right. Like John and Kanye, these people have heard of them. Like, and that at that point, I was like, I was just starting to rebuild my confidence from what happened at Def Jam, and I had all these hits, and I was like, I mean, you know, I thought I was good again. And then I was like, Drew, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Everybody was right. You can't do this. This isn't for you. It doesn't matter how many hits you make. You're going to have to cross this toll bridge at some point. Okay? So just stop kidding yourself. Mm. And I just called it. You know, I called it. And then I went to business school. John Legend called me and asked me to run his label. I, and, and I came back, like, out of retirement. And we made American Boy. I was the one that put Kanye on that record. I called him and said, yo, like, please look us out. Estelle didn't think American Boy was like the record she wanted to go with because she thought it was too pop. And we were waiting for Kanye to produce a track. And I was like, forget producing a track. How about he drop 16 on the joint we have that's already a smash? Okay, let's do that. And then he dropped like 48. That's how American Boy happened. My son is in the video at the end. He was like one, okay? And even that, like, I couldn't tolerate it because John's label was distributed by Atlantic. Julie Greenwald, Lior Cohen, Mike Kaiser, Kevin Lyles. I had to go up in there every day and be cool so we could break Estelle. And I'm looking at them, and they're cool with me, and I'm cool with them, and they know, and I know what went down. And I'm like, you know what? I'm a no, mom. I, I was just going to ask I can't, you. I can't do this. I can't swallow this anymore. And I quit. Three months later, Estelle won a Grammy. And somebody else sat with her on the front row of the Grammys. I am the one who made that happen. And I didn't even go. You know what I'm saying? Because it was mm. too painful to just disrespect myself. That's what I said. I don't even know. I don't think this is even in the movie. But I said, if you're a rape victim and you don't tell anybody what happens to you, you become an accessory after the fact mm. to the cover-up. I'm out here picking up his bloody gloves, making sure nobody thinks I'm a problem. And that does something to you. And you, you know, said you kept like, doing that until fire. other women came forward, and then you were like, "Wait, I can't let them." Now they're right. coming forward, and they're getting they're getting all their stories uh, right. poked holes in, and you have your story. Yes, and by then I'm sorry. Let me turn up my phone. By then I'm already like, you know what? I'm dead in the water. I'm over. That was 20 years ago, 22 years ago. I'm a mom. I have a 15 year old daughter. I have a 13 year old son. Okay, I want them to. I want to be able to look them in the eye one day and they ask about the Me Too moment. If anyone ever asks about the Me Too moment one day and say, I did the brave thing. You know, I'm raising a daughter and I want her to understand rape doesn't happen in alleyways at knife point. It can be in a penthouse apartment. It can be your boss who lures you into a trap, who breaks you down, who kicks the tires again and again and moves the bar for what you think is normal behavior with one little microaggression after the other until you're so far away from where you started in terms of what you think is normal. I need my daughter to know that. I need my son to know that. I'm also raising a black son in a world where we got the Central Park Five. You know, we got Karen trying to, you know, invoke white supremacism against a brother who's bird watching. I'm trying to put all that together. You know, and I was like, you know what, I, I have to do the thing my kids will be proud of one day. At this point, I'm a stay-at-home mom. My career is over. So I'm just going to go do the damn thing. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do it off the record. I'm going to have to do it. And hopefully somebody else will do it. And then I was like, well, we found these other women, but they're aware that you exist. They don't know who you are, but we kind of need you to do it for them to do it. And I was like, mm, mm. You know, so. Did you ever hear from Russell? Never. Never. What about Lior? Never. And Lior knows the story, the truth. You know, here's what I'll tell you. I'm a, I don't know, great news. I'll tell you what Julie Greenwald used to say to me all the time when I was a 23 and 24 year old executive at Def Jam. Drew, you should come out to the Hamptons. That's where it's really going down. If you want to move ahead money, you should come to the Hamptons and bring your knee pads. And I remember thinking, does Russell yeah. have a volleyball court? Because I played volleyball <laughs> in high school. And then I was like, oh, oh, my God, is that what she means? And I mean, I didn't even need to know the volleyball reference, what she really meant, to know I did not want to go to the Hamptons. As much as Russell had crossed the line with me and I'd had to smack his hand 
in the little bits of time, I didn't socialize with Russell. That's the other thing. Like I didn't, he was not like, I didn't, he wasn't my friend. I didn't, I mean, he, I worked for him and I needed to be around him just enough to get like, yes, no, yes, yes answers and conference him in to do my job. And he gave me stuff to do. Whereas Lior just wanted me to like hide in my office. And so I dealt with him just enough to do my job. I didn't want a personal relationship with him of any kind, especially because he was already inappropriate in the little bit of interaction I had with him. Well, that's so the important. last thing I want to do that's, is go to the Hamptons. Well, that's an important thing here, Drew. I'm sorry. I just want you to get to this part because if people haven't seen the film and only watch this interview, the story you tell of the rape is that specific. But there's also a lot of other stories in terms of – really inappropriate contact in your office at a club um uh, you know where you guys were having drinks work drinks after work one night that it almost seems like you were willing to sort of be like okay let me look the other direction from this already terrible behavior and then eventually it turned into something yeah you on a different level you describe russell as a tragic add puppy dog that i just had to keep retraining right you know, Russell's got like his sort of peaceful, even then, like his kind of mellow, he was already doing a little bit of yoga. You know, he's got like the, you know, like, oh, you know, very kind of like, you know, he, he's like, I don't know, he knows how to make himself seem like unthreatening. And so when he would do things like say on the phone as I'm conferencing in with like a lawyer and then he's on hold for me to conference him in with like Suge Knight to get some permission to use Snoop Dogg in the show soundtrack, whatever it was, right? Conferencing him in with Slick Rick in jail, right? You know, he's on hold and I would sort of wait to conference him in so I could like go through my checklist, my Russell checklist for the day. Sometimes in between those conference calls, he would be like, yo, my God, I love listening to you do business. Man, you're like so smart. My dick is so hard listening to you. And I'm yo, like, yo, Russell, yo. Rose, money, come on. Like, can we just stay focused? Cause wait, like, I, I just, I need you to focus on this next phone call and I need you to like not do that, okay? And then he'd be like, and then like after he would like call me back separately or he'd leave a message in my voicemail at home. Don't sue me for sexual harassment. Drew. You know, I'm like bananas I'm bananas. Like, I'm just crazy. Like, I hope you're not mad at me. Hit me back. Hit me back. Please tell me you're not mad at me. Oh, that, and then that's I call him. That like, part's deep. That's so I wanted crazy. to succeed. I wanted to survive at Def Jam long enough to have a hit to prove I could do it. I answered phones at three places before I even got that job. And I wanted to not fail. So I wanted to have something I could sh show for like proof that I was good at what I did. And so I was like, if I could just keep steering him in the other direction long enough to get to that point, then I'm good. And then I didn't realize on the Mary Meth duet that I should have typed my own credits because they didn't give me the credit. So then in the show, I actually typed the credits to make sure I got the credit for what I did. And, and I thought I was like out of the woods by then because it was a hit and I had the co-executive producer credit and so, and then like, that's when it happened, but yeah. So he would say stuff like that on the phone. And then like, I would be like, you know, I would have to sometimes meet him in, in a restaurant or quickly jump in the car and ride with him from one place to the other and like walk back to the office just to get him to pay attention long enough to like do my job, like answer three questions or listen to one thing. And so in one particular case, I was meeting him at a restaurant to kind of grab, like I would bring my notepads, you know what I mean? And like, wait for my window. And in this particular case, I went to the restroom and I came out and he was there and I just sort of moved out of the way thinking he was going to go in next. And he like pulled me into an open closet and I like fought him off. And I'm like, that's like not what we're doing. Here. That's just literally not what we're doing, you know? And again, he was so apologetic afterwards. He I was always a message when I got home, you know, he was like one of the only people who had a cell phone back then, by the way. So he would leave a message. And again, I didn't want to close the door because it took so long to get that door open and to get this job. And he was giving me opportunities. It's interesting. That's what's different. L.A. Reid would penalize me professionally. Russell would actually give me the opportunity and fight for me professionally. And then he would do the other thing, you know. And so in, in the doc, um, there's a, a, a conversation, Lauren, you pointed this out. Uh, around you as a black woman feeling like coming out against these successful black men was doing a disservice 
as a black human being, as a part of the black community. And there was this, you know, you were stuck in the middle on wanting to bring down black executives as a black woman because you know that they are dealing with racism and oppression and the structure as it is, but these terrible things are happening. Right. So that is like the struggle that goes on. It's going on in the streets today, right? I mean, the target on the backs of black men and boys is no joke. And it hasn't changed for 400 years, right? I am aware. I am aware. Okay. I'm a black woman in America and I have been my whole entire life. You know, I got a black mama and a black dad. You know, I got four black grandparents, regardless of how I appear. Okay. So I... I'm very protective of my men. And I I also understand that white people can like only consume sometimes like maybe one news story about black people at a time, maybe one and a half. And so if they got a headline, Russell Simmons is a rapist, then that's kind of like all they can digest. And now every innocent black man and every innocent black boy is gonna fall into that bucket, like that news cycle exposes every black boy and every black man. And with somebody love. like Russell, it's all a hip hop. Right. And exactly, right. Which was already counted out at that time in the black community, let alone the mainstream community. Right. I mean, you had Bill Cosby, ironically, talking about hip hop is bad and, and this, you know, is, is misrepresenting us, you know, and in, in the community at that time. So, I don't want to bring down a black man. I don't want to put a target on the backs of black men and boys or amplify the target that's already there. And I also didn't want to undermine hip hop and its upward rise, which Russell was so brilliantly helping to make happen. So I, I put all of that ahead of my own suffering and until I understand that this was happening to other women and other black women, it didn't click for me that the community of my sisters was also a community. I thought it was literally just me alone and I would just take it for the team. And I didn't understand that he was a serial rapist literally until 2017. Wow. And so then I, it's like, you know, I, 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 I think about, this may sound random, it's in the film, I talk about going to Ghana and this was like not maybe like a year after what happened to me, right? And I was struck. I went with my dad and a bunch of Howard University professors, just coincidentally. And I remember two things about the slave castles. One, there was a cannonball in the courtyard and its express purpose was attached to the ground, was to chain the ankle of the enslaved black women and in many cases, adolescent black girls by the ankle to this cannonball to be raped systematically day after day by the white slave traders, okay? So much so that if I'm not mistaken, more than half of the black women who arrived in North America after the Middle Passage were pregnant, which of course was like a bonus asset for the slave trader, okay? In addition, the other thing I remember about that slave castle in Ghana is there was a cell called the condemned cell and we went into it with our tour group and they shut the door and it was pitch black. It was like the size of underneath, like, I don't know, a dining table or something, right? And they turn on a flashlight and there's scratch marks in the wall. That is where the black men who try to defend the black women and girls were taken to die, okay? So this is like, this goes all the way back. This didn't start with Russell Simmons and me. This white supremacist breakdown of the black community and the relationship between black men and women is by design, it was engineered, okay? And so all I'm asking is can we please unlock that condemned cell in our brains, in our communities that's causing us to look away from the suffering of our own women and girls so we can be stronger to go out here and fight the oppression that we all have to fight as it is. Can we not be broken internally? So I realized ultimately that Russell Simmons is less important than the overall health of black women and men that we need to work on and do the hard work to address so that we can go and have a fighting chance against the headwinds of white supremacy, white supremacy, supremacy, 
that we all face every day to this day. In this country, we can't afford to be broken. And that's why I decided that was, that overrode my own fear of coming forward. And that's really why I stuck around and continued with this documentary, which was like not a good look for me personally in terms of what it's done to my life. You know, I was starting a company that got completely derailed. You know, it's been really hard, but I felt like when are we ever gonna have this shot again for filmmakers of this caliber to even care about us as black women? Mm. I have to just stand here and just let this story come out and, and hopefully it will make a difference. Drew Dixon, thank you so much. That's amazing. <sighs> that was great. Thank, thank you, you for Drew. giving so much today, too. You gave us a lot and, uh, and a lot of yourself. And hopefully uh, people will go out and um, enjoy this documentary, which is on HBO Max now. It's called On the Record. On the Record. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Every Thanks, Drew. Drew. Stay safe. And congratulations right. on your healing too. It sounds like Thank you're re you. you've really confronted it and you've dealt with it, and you know that's a, it's an amazing thing to get through. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, All Drew. Right. Take Thanks care. Drew. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.